Hello, and welcome to a special production from the Shuttle Tidarium podcast. I'm Phil Mead, co-pilot on the Shuttle Tidarium, and I'm proud to present this episode in our four-part backstory series for the Shuttle Tidarium Gen Con 2017 narrative event, Assault on Grayskull Base. If you're interested in where this story leads and want to take part in its dramatic conclusion, consider attending Gen Con 2017 and registering for our event. Registration opens on May 28th, and space will be limited. The full rules handbook for the narrative event will be released ahead of registration. For more details, be sure to keep an eye out in all the usual internet places. And you can always listen to the Shuttle Tidarium podcast for additional information. Now, sit back and enjoy the episode. In the anemic starlight of deep space, thousands of dust-gray asteroids tumble gently in a millennia-old gravitational dance. Their ancient, cratered faces had no memory of the wars that had raged back and forth across the galaxy. No stake in the current conflict. They drifted and spun through the ages just as they always had, except for one of them. A trio of snubfighters abruptly snapped into reality at the edge of the cluster. Aggressive, rugged, X-wing-class ships they immediately angled towards the center of the asteroid group and accelerated. Drop back to Overwatch position 5 and 10. S foils in attack position. All right, copy later. To position 5, S foils to attack. Got it, lead. Keep your scanners on passive until we get to the center. Boss mentioned automated defenses. In the cockpit of the lead X Wing, Colonel Jack Bolin kept his hands firm on the throttle and the control stick. His eyes roved back and forth across his canopy, darting to a sensor readout periodically. No, I don't think so. I don't really like Voss, but I do trust his sense of greed. He only gets paid if we find his base. So I'm pretty sure we'll find something. Yes. No. Exactly. Bolin gently navigated around a smaller asteroid with a particularly unstable spin, giving it a wide berth just to be safe. Dust struck his particle deflector as he swung back onto his course toward the center of the asteroid field, registering the small flashes of light on his shielding. I see it, I see it. Angle the deflectors. A warning light winking red on his display, Bolin pulled hard on the control stick and slammed the throttle forward, sending his fighter into a hard turn that pressed him down into the bottom of his ejection seat. Heads up! I'm getting painted with a targeting laser! Going evasive! Two, stay with me! Three, take out anything that looks hostile! Roger! Three, offensive! Bolin whipped his X-Wing around again, diving in close behind a kilometer-wide asteroid to break contact, throwing up billowing wakes of dust as his thruster exhaust washed across the surface of the asteroid. Great. Targeting laser destroyed. No other hostiles on sensors. None? That laser wasn't painting me for fun. Regardless, no hostiles on sensors, leader. Very well. Nice shooting, three. Form back up on me. Copy, leader. Well, at least we know there's something here, leader. Always the optimist. As his two wingmates took their positions behind him, Bolin throttled back and swung his X-Wing around in a gentle turn, heading deeper into the asteroid cluster, hands tense on the controls again. The deeper they flew into the asteroid cluster, the darker it became, as more and more asteroids and dust particles blocked the already weak starlight. Soon, Bolin was flying almost entirely by his sensors. Something on the scope, boss. Send it to me, too. A sensor data relay scrolled across Bolin's display. There was a massive metallic object ahead with faint energy signals. Right where Voss said it would be. Let's do two laps and then we'll approach. Breaking port. Bolin plotted a course to make a rough orbit of the object, taking the first flight around it once, then twice, scanning the entire time. The three X-Wing sensors worked together to paint a picture of a massive asteroid, its surface dotted intermittently with structures. The largest, according to Voss, would be the Hangar Bay, which was Bolin's next destination. The wide mouth of the Hangar Bay, along with two larger structures above it, reminded Bolin of a grinning skull. 
given the purported tenants of this place, that was probably not a coincidence. Kind of looks like a big gray skull, doesn't it, R4? Well, I don't really know if it'll be safe for Astromex, R4. No, R4. We'll have to go in and see what the interior condition is. Yes, R4. Me too. That's fine. Just make sure no one steals the ship while I'm gone, alright? Up close, the haphazard construction of the base was apparent. Exposed cabling and mismatched panels were the rule, not the exception. On top of that, there was clear damage to many of the surface structures. The hangar was no exception. Two wrecked ships, a charred YT-2400 and an ancient Y-Wing greeted him from the edge of the open hangar doors, coated with a fine layer of asteroidal dust. The only thing that was still functional was the gravity plating, and even that looked like it was starting to go, according to his X-Wing sensors. Two, three, leader. I'll land first. Maintain overwatch till I'm out of the cockpit. Then, follow me in. Roger. Acknowledge. Colonel Bolin eased his X-Wing into the hangar, closing his S-foils and extending his landing gear. Passing over the shipwrecks at the edge of the hangar, he found a clear spot on the deck and gently set his ship down, facing outwards in case he had to blast back out of the hangar in a hurry. R4, maglock the gear to the deck. I don't trust this gravity. Bolin ran a final check on his environment suit before cracking the cockpit. Normally, he only wore an emergency survival unit, as most pilots did. But today, he wore a full environment suit, more like what a TIE pilot would normally wear, complete with self-contained rebreathers in a fully pressurized environment. If one of his seals was bad, he wouldn't have that much time to repressurize the cockpit before he lost consciousness. After his seals checked out, he tested his personal comm, headlamp, and checked the power pack on his blaster one last time. As satisfied as he could be, he popped the canopy. The tiny pocket of atmosphere rushed out with a brief whoosh, and then the silence of vacuum settled over Bolin. His suit puffed outward slightly at the loss of external pressure, but Bolin didn't notice any difference inside the suit itself. So far, so good. Climbing out now. Bolin stood up in the cockpit and peered around the vast hangar. There was clutter everywhere, more shipwrecks, equipment strewn across the deck haphazardly, but nothing that looked dangerous. He drew his blaster, nonetheless. Bolin dropped to the floor from the edge of the cockpit with practiced ease, the bright orange environment suit impeding him just enough to make the action a little stiffer than he was used to. I'm out and about. No problems yet. Just a big mess on the inside. Come on in and join me. Bolin kept his eyes on the hangar interiors as wingmates landed their X-Wings. The hangar was big. Big enough for a bulk freighter, probably. Gray dust from the asteroid cluster had settled over everything in the vacuum, painting everything in the hangar a uniform white-gray, like ash or bone. Bolin felt his wingmates land through the deck plates, and he waved them over, still watching the hangar. Looks deserted, boss. Talon, your Astromex jump jets are functional. Have your Astromex pop out and follow us in. We'll probably need a droid on the inside. Maya Knowles' Astros will stay with the ship, just in case. R3A4, come on. Doors over there, let's go. The three pilots carefully made their way across the deck stepping around a stripped-down engine housing and passing by what looked like a scratch-built engine nacelle on their way to the door. Pirates, always scrounging and slapping together anything they think might fly. Reminds me of us, actually. Speak for yourself, Moles. My X-Wing is factory new. For now. How long do you think this has been abandoned? Cut the chatter. We don't know what's on the other side of this door. Act professional. Knowles, watch our rear at all times. Tellin, I want your eyes on the side quarters and doorways. R3, stay with Lieutenant Tellin. Bolin wiped a layer of dust off the door's control panel. It was dark. No power. He thumbed the door switch anyway, but nothing happened. Looking around the door frame, he found a manual release lever and pulled down hard on it. The lever moved easily, and the door budged a little in its frame. Help me pull it open. The door moved grudgingly in its track, but eventually opened wide enough to allow even the astromech through the gap. 
Inside, there was no light except for the three pilots' headlamps and a work lamp R3A4 projected from his dome. The door opened into a hallway which was just as cluttered as the hangar, but was mercifully free of dust. The thick insulation that made up the tunnel's walls was painted a bright bucolic blue color, but exposed cabling hung limp from the low ceilings, and there were dark smears scattered across the walls. Blast marks. No light, monsieur. Looks like there was some plaster clay here, too. How long do you think this has been abandoned? Voss said that the last group he knew used this place fell off the scopes about three years ago. So are we trusting Voss now? Come on, let's what we can see. We need to check the bridge, engineering spaces, and the life support systems. Time's a wasting. The three pilots moved slowly down the corridor, following the power cables deep into the bowels of the station, blasters drawn and headlamps scanning. They passed through several sections of the station, passing a storeroom still filled with crates, dormitories, several sealed off chambers, all dark and deserted. Eventually, the power cabling led them to a doorway marked power, and below, in a graffiti scrawl, Logan's team only. Everyone else, stay out. Looks like the right place. Bolin reached for the manual release and pulled it down. It moved easily. Too easily. The door didn't move at all, and when Bolin pushed on it, it didn't budge. Manual release seems to be out of order. I guess they were serious about keeping people out. R3, see what we can do about this door. <laughs> The astromech, happy to finally be of use, trundled up to the door panel and summarily wrenched the panel off with the manipulator. With the wiring exposed, R3A4 went to work with a more delicate touch, using its manipulator arm and arc welder to rewire the controls, and connecting its own power supply directly to the door mechanism. Nice work, open it up. The door slid open, grinding in its track enough for Bolin to feel the vibration through his feet and hear it in his ears. It probably would have been deafening if there had been atmosphere to carry the sound. Bolin waited for the door to stop, then stepped through. As soon as he crossed the threshold, there was a blinding flash and the sharp crack of an explosion. Bolin stumbled backwards, tripped and fell onto the floor. A red-gloved hand grabbed at him from behind and yanked him out of the doorway. Bolin, are you alright? Uh, fine, I think. How do I look, Knowles? The deep blue-skinned Mon Calamarian looked Bolin up and down, his huge eyes barely visible through the faceplate of his red environment suit. He patted and brushed Bolin's suit in a couple of places. Doesn't look bad, Colonel. Superficial damage to the suit, I think. Tell him, what was that thing? Bolin pulled himself to his feet with a helping hand from Knowles. Tellum was trying to peer inside the room, but his bulky white environment suit wasn't making it very easy. He handed Bolin a blaster. Bolin's blaster, which Bolin suddenly realized that he'd dropped when he fell. Some kind of explosive charge? Door must have triggered it, leader. Oh, really? Now we know how you made it to the top of your class in the academy, Lieutenant. Brilliant deduction. Bolin gently pulled Tellen away from the door and stepped back to peer inside, blaster drawn and trained on the interior. There was a big generator in the middle of the room, long dead. Stacks of crates formed barricades facing the door, covered in ancient blast marks. Close by the door, the ruined remains of a blaster carbine and an improvised gun rack aimed at the doorway smoldered. R3, give me a scan of the room. Look for anything with an active power signature. Good, that's what I thought. Alright R3, head on in and give me another scan. Well, he just told me there's nothing in there. He'll be fine. Now, move it and give me a scan. The red and white astromech rolled meekly into the room, warily scanning back and forth with its headlamp and sensor array. After a meter, it stopped and spun its dome around briefly. A full scan, please, R3. That's better. Bolin took a deep breath and stepped inside the room. After a brief scan of the room, more blaster-scarred barricades, and behind them, the industrial equipment that had once powered the station, Bolin picked up the blaster carbine. What do you think, Knowles? E-21. Don't see those very often. Probably linked to a tripwire sensor, aimed at the door. I bet that the actuating module was corroded and blew when the blaster triggered. 
We should be more careful, Leader. The actuating modules on E11 are good for about a decade. If this was one of those, we all might be a lot less cheerful right now. Alright, let's see about that generator. Carefully. Tellen stepped past R3A4 and slowly climbed over a barricade, obviously looking for any sort of trap that may not have shown up on the droid scans. Peering over the edge, he suddenly yelped and pulled up his blaster. Bolin and Knoll's own blasters were suddenly up, pointed at the barricade, but Tellen waved them off. What is it? It's just a previous tenant, and I don't think they're going to make it. Tellen dropped down on the other side of the barricade, and Bolin climbed up to take a look. Slumped against the red crates of the barricade was a grotesquely frozen husk of a Rodian dressed in yellow overalls, a blaster pistol close by. Well, we saw signs of a fight. I guess this guy was on the losing end. No blast marks on him, though. Boss, there's more. Bolin dropped down and stood next to Tellen. Scattered across the room, about a dozen figures lay in various poses, most dressed in the same yellow overalls as a Rodian, most armed with blasters. What do you think, Knowles? Logan's crew? Maybe. Hard to know for sure. Whoever they are, I'm betting they were either cast or they were in here when this room lost atmosphere. Another pleasant thought, Knowles. All right. R3, you stay here. Get to work on this Jenny. See if you can restore power to the station. Be careful and check in every five minutes. Well, we're looking for the command center. Come on. The command center was not far from the generator room. Both had been buried deep in the asteroid to protect them from outside attack, and were probably close to the core of the asteroid. The three pilots approached the command center carefully, passing several blaster-scorched barricades on their way, but when Bolin pulled the manual release for the command center's door, it opened easily, and nothing tried to blast him. After taking a good, long look inside the doorway, Bolin stepped inside the command center. Among the dead displays and control stations, one body lay slumped back in a seat. A grisly blaster wound to the head made the desiccated corpse species difficult to identify, but Bolin guessed it had been human, and judging by the blaster laying on the floor, he guessed the wound was self-inflicted. Strange. Yeah. Only one man? Did he kill the rest and then off himself? Even for pirates? Uh, I don't get it. Bolin holstered his blaster for the first time since he'd set foot on the station, and started checking the corpse's pockets. Come on, look around. Maybe there's something here that can tell us... Overhead lights flickered on, flooding the room with light, and the control screens started winking to life all around the three pilots. Tellen flinched with surprise as the door to the control room slid shut behind them. Great work, R3. Stay there and monitor the generator. We'll pick you up on the way out. Alright, check the systems. Maybe we can get an idea of what happened. On it, boss. The screen in front of Bolin, and incidentally the corpse, turned out to be surveillance footage from the hangar. A live feed, Bolin noted, seeing their three X-wings and a trail of dusty footprints. But the camera itself was focused on the wrecked YT-2400, and their ships just happened to be in frame. Bolin glanced back at the corpse. What about this shot could have made someone shoot themselves? I've got an inventory here. Looks like someone was looking through their warehouse inventory for engine parts. Um, two years ago. And a few days before that, they were looking for food. And water recyclers. Wouldn't they have had all that on board anyway? Yes. <sighs> what, Knowles? Well, obviously there was a fight here. Someone either gassed or Max is the engineering crew, that seems obvious. And all the barricades and blaster scorches. We know there was a fight. Maybe one side, the engineers, let's say, sabotaged the water recycler, and maybe the food supply, tried to hold everyone else hostage by refusing to repair it. The others, they didn't like that. They ended up fighting back, and eventually backing those engineers. Then what? They leave? Commit suicide? They would probably try to get more supplies. But something went wrong, obviously. Our friend here is evidence of that. Bolin tapped at the surveillance station's controls. We've got some recordings here. Bolin set the surveillance footage to play in reverse and upped the speed to the highest setting. The footage jumped back two years, displaying a similarly cluttered but dustless hangar bay. The YT-2400 still prominently featured. 
As the 20th day scrolled by, the YT-2400 was abruptly restored. Boland stopped the footage and played it back. Figures appeared around the freighter, carrying equipment in and out of the ship. Boland advanced the recording until he found what he was looking for. The figures boarded the YT-2400 one last time, and it lifted off the deck. The freighter drifted forward a few meters, then thick white steam blasted out of the drive section. The freighter lurched, then something inside the ship exploded, sending panels flying out in all directions. Before long, flames snaked out through the new breaches in the hull, and Boland watched the fire burn itself out on the high-speed footage. Well, looks like we know what went wrong. My guess is that the engineers sabotaged all the ships in addition to the water recyclers. Probably did it in secret before trying to take power or whatever else they were trying to accomplish. The other pirates killed the engineers, tried to improvise repairs on the ship. Something went badly wrong. Our friend here, who was probably meant to watch the station while the others retrieved supplies, saw it all happen and decided to shoot themselves rather than die of thirst. I knew there was a reason I joined the Alliance instead of Black Sun. Right. Lovely story, Knowles. Well, what do you think? About the station, I mean. Uh, obviously, no one knows about it. It's probably well stocked. Potentially sabotage water recycler and other booby traps aside. And that hangar looks like it could easily accommodate three squadrons and a number of light freighters. There might be more perimeter defenses that we don't know about, but that could actually be a feature if we can take control of them from here. And provided they don't kill us on the way out. Well, it looks like I owe Voss a drink. Let's make ourselves home.